Hello, welcome to Cosmology Talks. Today we have Patricia Diego Palazuelos, who is a PhD student at the Cantabria Physics Institute, and Johannes Eskilt, who is a PhD student at the University of Oslo. They'll be giving us an update on CMB birefringence. The previous talk on CMB birefringence is actually the most popular one on the whole channel, but is now almost two years old. And the one, the most recent one on parity violation in the large scale structure is also a very, very popular one. So I figured it would be a good idea to get an update on what the state of CMB parity violation is in 2022. And so I contacted Ichiro and Yuto, who were the speakers of the previous talk, and they recommended Patricia and Johannes. So here we are. They're going to give us an update on the state of CMB birefringence in 2022. So welcome, Johannes and Patricia. Do you want to start by telling us what is described in your, in your recent papers on the topic? So in, in the past two years, we've done quite a bit of work on birefringence using the CMB as a probe. We have one main publication that is like the major advance that we did for uh, physical review letters, where we kind of updated the previous work that Yuto and Ichiro already showed in this channel. And then we also explored the effect that uh, galactic foregrounds can have in the measurement of wire fringes, which happened to be quite remarkable. And after that, we kind of just keep working, and Johannes will tell you more about that. But we uh, kind of explore the dependence of the signal with frequency, which can tell us more about the origin and also uh, added new data to the analysis to increase the significance. Cool. And and just to spoil the, the end result, it's, the significance is broadly similar to what Ichiro and Yuto found. You, you haven't kind of found out that the signal was entirely foregrounds or, or the signal hasn't increased to 10 sigma. It's, it's still sort of sitting there at three-ish sigma. Three sigma, yes, but we have proven that the methodology is robust against systematics, so we can discard that origin, and we are also more secure that it's not produced by foregrounds. I see. All right, cool. Um, Johannes, do you have additional thoughts? Um, yeah, so I would say that Patricia and I have worked on this the past two years, and I would still say that cosmic biofringe is still very much alive. The main concern, I remember, when the uh, Yuto and Achille paper came out was that people were concerned about the EB of the foreground, and we have taken that seriously. We have uh, mitigated the effect of dust EB in two different ways, and we still find the signal. And in my recent work with Achille Komatsu, we added WMAC as well, and that reached the, well, that increased the significance to 3.6 sigma, and so it doesn't seem to go away at all. Cool. All right, so uh, if... Six months from now, people are remembering this this talk, or you know your series of papers, or a year or two from now. What would be the two things you would want them to remember to have clear in their mind? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that we are both looking for postdoc positions. Ah, <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> then the true answer is that we have found a, a positive birefringence angle of around 0.3 degrees in Planck data that the measurement is robust against systematics, uh, but sensitive to dust TV, since we use foregrounds as our calibrator. And uh, even so, even though we still need to work on the foreground model a bit, uh, in the past two years, we have uh, gone from a 2.4 sigma significance to 3.6 by adding WMAP data, and the angle seems to remain there at uh, 3.6 degrees. So things are starting to get interesting, and we would love to continue the search in other data sets, especially those coming from ground experiments, and are fully open to collaborate on that. Yeah, I, I, I fully, fully agree with that. I, I really hope that ground-based telescopes will start looking at this, because so far it's only been like us, actually, or you two and some others who have been doing this with Planck data. I would love to see ground-based telescopes do this with their own data. Right. Is, is, the, is the data from, say, ACT and SPT not, not public such that people like yourselves can just do it. So there are two ways of doing this kind of measurements. Either use the foreground uh, to the foreground polarization to calibrate your instruments, or you can calibrate them very well on the ground. And the latter is much better. Just make sure your miscalibration angles are very, very small. And I think ground-based telescopes are starting to take that seriously and are going to do that. And so that I am interested in. Because if you can guarantee that the miscalibration angles are small, then you don't have to be that worried about dust EB or foreground EB. Um, you can just measure EB and see if that looks like an EE power spectrum. And Because that, that was the whole clever thing in Ichiro and Yuto's paper of calibrating this angle using the, the dust, I guess. Foreground, yes, exactly. Exactly. But you can't do the actual measurement of the angle with Planck because it's out there in space, whereas if you've got something sitting at the South Pole or in Atacama, you can just go out there. I don't know how you would do it, I guess, but with, with some earthly device to actually measure it on, on the actual telescope. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, there are some proposals to use drones to calibrate and things like that. So, yeah. Ah, cool. So it sounds like there'll be um, 
interesting well hopefully interesting things to come from act and SBT in the near future uh all right awesome so so why did you do this i guess the viewers of the channel maybe know the answer to that because as i said the previous one on cmp pyrofringence was the most viewed one on the channel so they understand why this is interesting but from your own perspectives why is this interesting and so i would say that it would be extremely cool if we could find parity violating physics on a cosmological scale and uh, if this signal is real it could be evidence of very light axions, super light axions, which I will justify uh, later in, in this talk. And that would be very cool to find. Yeah, I, I fully agree. First, evidence of parity violating physics outside of the weak interaction, and also some possible observable coming from dark matter or even dark energy axions. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's get into the details then. Let's... So we've known for a while now that the majority of the energy content of the universe is in the form of dark matter and dark energy. And the question nowadays is uh, understanding what are these dark matter and dark energy components. And one of the most popular candidates for dark matter are axion like particles, which depending on the actual mass of the particle can even be a solution for, for dark energy. They are described by a parity violating pseudo-scalar field that can couple to electromagnetism via Chen-Simons interaction, and that interaction makes the phase velocities of the right and left-handed helicity states of photons differ, and that has the consequence of rotating the plane of linear polarization clockwise in the sky by this beta angle here that depends on the coupling constant of the interaction and the time evolution of the action field. And this rotation of polarization is what we commonly know as cosmic birefringence because it is as if space itself was behaving like a classical birefringent crystal. In principle, if we just had a very well-known source of linearly polarized light situated very far away from us, we could just try to measure the rotation of its polarization and use that to constrain these action models. And as you have probably guessed by now, because you already saw the previous talk, the cosmic microwave background is the perfect tool to do this and is the one we are going to use today. Well, just as a very brief recap on the polarization of the cosmic microwave background, we usually, usually describe it uh, using E and B modes instead of the Stokes Q and U parameters. And uh, this, this, this decomposition happens to be very helpful for the analysis at hand because E and B modes are eigenstates of parity. We have E modes that are parity even and B modes that are parity odd, so that when we calculate their spherical harmonic coefficients and correlate them, we are going to get two sets of parity even angular power spectra, EE and BB, and then one parity of EV cross correlation. But in, in lambda CDM, we believe that the universe has no preferred direction, and that means that the statistics of CMB and isotropies have to be invariant under parity transformations. So we expect the CMB to have no EV correlation, and if we ended finding some, then it would be evidence of parity violating physics in the universe, which will be the first evidence outside of the quick interaction. So very exciting. And if we now introduce axions, we know that the spherical harmonic coefficients of the CMB that we observe must be a rotation of the original ones. And that means that the observed PV spectrum is no longer zero, but instead a rotation of the CMB angular power spectra. And we can generalize this expression a bit more with some algebra so that we have the observed PV spectrum being a rotation of the also observed EE and BB spectra. And this very, very simple equation right here has been the base of the majority of the uh, search for cosmic birefringence done in the past. However, there is really no way of knowing whether this rotated TV that we are measuring has a cosmological origin or if ja it's just a miscalibration of the polarization angle of the detector, because both effects produce rotations that are completely degenerate. Meaning that if the instrument is miscalibrated by an alpha angle, when we look at the measure EV, we are actually sensitive to alpha plus beta instead of just beta. But in, in 2019, Yutuminami, Ichiro Komatsu and collaborators came up with a clever way to bypass this limitation. And the key point is that the amplitude of the birefringence rotation only depends on the value of the action field at the moment of photon emission and absorption. And if the action field is uh, evolving slowly, then essentially it means that birefringence is proportional to the propagation length of photons. And in that case, it is safe to assume that the rotation experienced by galactic foreground photons that were emitted right next to us is going to be negligible when compared to that seen by CMB photons that have been traveling since recombination. So uh, galactic foregrounds would only be significantly affected by the miscalibration of the detector. And if we work with frequency maps instead of clean CMB maps, then we can use foregrounds as our calibrator. Just a quick question. And, and is it possible in principle that what's being observed is a primordial correlation between E and B? Because there is there are primordial B 
fields in principle. They're maybe too small to have been observed, but, but maybe they have been observed via, via this. That's something very possible. In fact, there are some models of patchy inflation or chiral gravitational waves that could produce that signal, or even the CMB could have that signal. And we could uh, very much take it into account because this equation here, or maybe it's clear to see in this one, should have another term that depends on the cosine of four times beta times this other EV, intrinsic EV coming from other processes. So as long as we have a model to predict the shape of this spectra, we can also take it into account and we could at the same time fit something that looks like a rotation of EE, which will be by refringence, and then something with a different spectral dependence. But so at the moment, the observations, it could be either or, or it is much more likely to be by refringence? It's right now, I would say, much more likely to be by refringence because as Johannes will show in a minute, when you start to stack the spectra to increase uh, the signal to noise, it really resembles a rotation of EE, at least at the scales at, we, at which we have good signal to noise. So we need to add foregrounds to our model of the observed signal with them being only rotated by alpha, unlike the CMB. And that means that the observed PV spectrum has the same term as before and two additional ones. One that depends on the intrinsic EV correlation of foregrounds and one that is just an additional rotation of the CMB spectra. And we could even simplify this a bit more because according to current experimental constraints, the intrinsic EV from foregrounds is still statistically compatible with being zero. And that's it. That's the base of the methodology. From this equation, we can just build a Gaussian likelihood and use that to simultaneously determine both by refringence and miscalibration angles. And the only two ingredients we will need is the EE, BB, and EV spectra observed across the different frequency bands of any given CMB experiment, and a theoretical model for the CMB angular power spectra, which we can determine very precisely within Lambda CDM. So this big red cross, how does one independently measure that in order to, I mean, I, I guess, what did Planck Collaboration 11 2020 and Materia Tau 2022 do to independently measure that? Yeah, you can concentrate on the frequency bands of the Planck experiment that are mostly dominated by synchrotron or by dust and try to analyze them to see if where the foreground signal dominates, you see a significant EV or a significant TV. And you use that to put, put up limits on, on the value of this. And yeah, this is the methodology that Yutominami and Ichiro Komatsu applied to the third data release of Planck data in 2020, which they presented in this channel. And they found a wide fringence angle of 0.35 plus minus 0.14 degrees, which made for a very tantalizing signal of 2.4 sigma significance. And after seeing that, they obviously wanted to keep working on it, and they uh, wanted to update the measurement using the latest release of Planck data, known as PR4 or M5, which, to give a bit of context, offers a new reprocessing of the Rowan calibrated data from, LFA, from the low and high frequency instruments of Planck, and it achieves a scale-dependent reduction of the total uncertainty due to the addition of data taken during repointer maneuvers and a general improvement in the modeling of noise and systematics. And this is where Johannes and I joined the project because as soon as U2 and Ishiro started to, to work with M5 data, they saw that the significance of the, measuring, the measurement keep growing up and they wanted to gain some more insight on the data to be sure that they were doing everything correctly and it was not systematics or anything and they contacted the people that work in the reprocessing for M5, and we happen to be in those groups. And at the beginning, it was just a pretty straightforward continuation of, of the work they had previously done. So we still work with 100, 143, 217, and 353 GHz data. We still focus on small scale information, and we still neglect the foreground every contribution. The only difference is that we change half mission splits for detector splits, because they allow for a greater reduction of noise and systematics when you cross-correlate them. And the other strong point of the analysis is that since now we are working in a collaboration, we found that we have consistent results across four independent pipelines operated by different people that use different pseudo shell estimator and also slightly different implementations. We have Johannes, Juto, and Mathieu Tristan, who follow the original implementation and obtain the posterior distribution through Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And I use an iterative algorithm that analytically calculates the maximum likelihood solution, which makes for a much faster algorithm that allows the simulation study that I will present later. And to start with the results, at the beginning, we just mask extragalactic point sources and the regions where the emission of the carbon monoxide line was the brightest. And for this almost full sky configuration, we found a birefringence angle of 0.3 plus minus 0.11 degrees which was consistent with, but more precise than previous measurements, including the one that Yuto and Ichiro got from the PR3 analysis. 
And after seeing this, we were very happy and started to thought about some consistency checks that we could do. And the first one that came to mind is that since the two angles that were fitting, both by fringe and some miscalibrations, are isotropic rotations of the whole sky. So in principle, no matter what region of the sky we're looking at, we should get compatible results. And we wanted to test that, but we found out that as soon as we started masking the regions of brightest foreground emission in the galactic plane, the measurement of birefringence started to decrease, reaching even negative values when we mask about uh, 30% of the galactic plane. And this was a bit surprising at first, because it seems to point out that the signal we're finding is anisotropic. But actually, the birefringence signal is not anisotropic. And Johannes will show a plot where you can see that very clearly in a minute. But even though birefringence is independent of the mask, our inferred values of alpha do depend on the mass because we are using galactic foregrounds and in particular at this frequency is thermal dust emission to constrain miscalibration angles. And in that sense, if there is indeed a dust CV correlation that we didn't account for so far, then that can bias our measurement of miscalibration angles, dragging with them the measurement of birefringence. And you can see that in this plot, where in addition to one of the measurements uh, of birefringence from before in orange, I have also plotted the average of the eight miscalibration angles that we find at each sky fraction. And you see how the miscalibration angles increase as you reduce the, the sky fraction. And that forces the measurement of beta to decrease because the alpha plus beta sum uh, has to remain constant because they are still uh, generated to some extent. And now that we know that this is a problem, we just need a model for dust TV so that we can correct for it and obtain an unbiased measurement of the true wide fringing angle in the sky. But so this dust TV, was that not the thing that these other groups, that that red cross that I asked about that people had measured and you said was small? So, so why are they not measuring a dust EB? You could say that they have hints of it, but it's still statistically compatible with being zero. So it's small enough to not be detected, let's say, but we are still seeing its effect here. I see. It, looking at this plot, it seems that it's like it's ten percent of the sky that's having almost all of the effect to to push alpha from point four down to minus point one, right? Like, because at point eight five of the sky, it's still sitting there consistent with everything else, and then suddenly this last ten percent of the sky seems to be having a very dramatic effect as you go to point nine five of the sky. Is there some reason why just ten percent of the sky should have such a dramatic effect? I don't know if it's something specific about ten percent or it's just a continuous downgrade, and it happens to cross zero around that point. But if maybe Johannes has some more insight about it. So I would say that what you're seeing here is the effect of dust EB, um, which we'll talk about later. And dust EB isn't that well understood yet, so why it matters so much on larger sky fraction and less on larger sky fraction is not well understood, I think, at all. Yeah, so that, that is the, I think that's the answer. Dust EB is weird. Okay, okay. I mean, my, my skepticism alarms are going off now that, that like, if, if, if what's happening is just a misunderstanding of this dusty B, then perhaps the correct line here is a purple line that goes through at about 0.4 and a yellow line that goes through with error bars at about point, minus 0.1, consistent with, with zero. Yeah, I don't think you should read too much into this yet, because we have to take dusty B into account, and that will change the plot. And now the idea is to explain the both models that we use for DustTV. So I don't know if Johannes, you want to do yours first. Yeah, so, so DustEB does matter and it has to be taken into account, especially for larger masks. And we have mitigated the effect of DustEB in two completely different ways. Uh, Patricia will talk about her way later. My way is a more physics-inspired model based on a dust ansatz inspired by Clark and collaborators. An idea is basically to relate dust EB to dust TB, which has been measured by Planck. The approach is very generic. Planck measured the TB of dust, TE of dust, and EE of dust, but not the EB of dust. But you can relate EB to these other power spectras by using this generic approach here. Uh, by just playing around with spherical harmonics coefficients, you get that it should be proportional and so where does the dust EB come from? Um, Planck measured dust TB to be positive, and that would also suggest that dust EB should also be positive, and that was also shown to be true by Clark and um, collaborators on, uh, on large sky masks. And the, the physics behind this is that the dust filaments in the sky are not fully parallel with local magnetic fields, and so there's a misalignment angle. 
and that can create EB correlations. That is described in Clark et al. in detail. Oh, sorry, just can I ask you a question about that plot? You, you say in the words that if TB is greater than zero, EB should be greater than zero, but it seems it seems that the period of TB is twice the period of EB. So what, why is it that, because there are regions where TB is greater than zero and EB is less than zero. So this rotation angle, the misalignment angle is generally very small. So we create an ansatz based on their results, which is to relate the EB of dust to this equation, or is uh, proportional to the EE of dust, multiplied by the sinus of four times the misalignment angle that I just showed. And we calculate this misalignment angle by taking the TB and TE of the 353 gigahertz that you can see in the upper right here. At 353 gigahertz, dust dominates very much, and you cannot see much CMB in the data. And so we take the TB and the TE from that map, calculate the misalignment angle, and then put that into the top equation there. And so what I did was I put that into the equation and I sample the proportionality constant A there simultaneously with beta and alpha. And then, so psi L from that was then just a number that had been, in a sense, from your perspective, already measured elsewhere that, that just gets inputted. Yeah. So the 353 gigahertz is just dust. And so we say that all the TB and all the TE comes from dust. And then we calculate that misalignment angle. Yeah, and for our second approach, we just adopt the Commander Sky model as our program model. To give a, a bit of context, uh, a common procedure to obtain clean CMB maps from your observations is to assume that you have a common CMB component and some parametric model to describe the other galactic emissions. And Commander is a Bayesian code that does exactly that. It assumes that we have a common CMB component and it describes synchrotron as a power law and thermal dust as a one component modified black body. So it takes us input frequency maps and gives you as output the observed CMB and templates for the synchrotron and dust emission. And we just take the commander template for dust emission, calculate its angular power spectra and introduce it into our equations, leaving it also a free amplitude parameter to fit alongside beta and alpha in the likelihood. And with these two approaches, we get the results that you see now in black and purple respectively. And now that we are taking dust TV into account, you see that the decline disappears and we get a mostly positive by refringence angle across all sky fractions, confirming that indeed the decline was produced by this dust TV. And we also found a very good agreement between both models, except at the almost full sky configuration at uh, F sky 0.93. But the fact that the discrepancy happens mostly there may just be telling us that Commander is struggling to reproduce the very complex structure of dust at the center of the galactic plane. And these are all the results from the first article. And now Johannes has the continuation with the other ones. So uh, the results that Patricia just showed were the results of our paper that we published in Physical Review Letters, uh, showing that dust EB matters. We still find the same positive beta measurement at all sky fractions. And when we model dust EB in two completely different ways, after that, Patricia and I did different aspects of cosmic biofringence, and I will be talking about what I did after that paper. And that basically boils down to two different things, and that is add more data, adding more of the Planck data, also adding WMAP, and the other part is also understanding the origin of the signal by looking at the frequency dependence of the, of the signal. Can I, can I just dwell on this dust EB just for a second? Do you now, essentially from the results that Patricia just showed, have a prediction? Because you've, you've kind of constrained the amplitude of the dust EB. Do you now sort of have a prediction that if people were to, to look directly for dust EB, they should find it with this amplitude? Because I'm still just kind of struggling with this. When they directly looked for it, they didn't see it. And now you're saying that it, it's present enough that it's affecting the results when you look for a rotation angle. In a way, yes, because we can put, let's say, an upper limit of what the amplitude must be so that we go from this decline to something more constant. But I don't know if we have enough signal to noise to kind of constrain that. So we are an evidence that dust TV is there and is important, but I wouldn't say we are a full on detection of dust TV. Okay, but you could, you could kind of, at the moment, your results are like, I want to measure beta. But if you said, okay, actually the thing I care about is dust EB, you, you could make a plot with a kind of error bar of it's X plus or minus Y. And then someone else can go and measure that directly and say, we are or are not consistent with, with your prediction. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the work that Susan Clark, Brandon Heisley, and, and collaborators are doing. They are kind of just figuring figuring that out and trying to, to measure that. 
because that feels to me like a super crucial consistency check because if they if they do it and they get a, a value that's smaller than what you're saying it has to be then something's going wrong but if they get exactly within those error bars then it's like okay cool exactly we understand what's happening you know you can't carry on with the excitement so uh, if you take the results from clark et al paper and you, uh, yeah clark et al paper and you do some napkin math you should get that if you neglect dust eb it's biased by negative minus half a degree and so if you add that to the plot that Patricia showed, you suddenly get 0.3 degrees again. Yeah, so what we then did is that we asked the question, what happens if you include all the Planck maps? Because so far we only included the HFI maps, and that is the high-frequency instruments maps. But Planck also had low-frequency instruments, and those, we didn't use them because they have more noise. There's lower signal-to-noise ratio for those. But we decided to add them, and they also are not dust dominated. They are synchrotron dominated, which are uh, radiation caused by electrons moving in magnetic fields. And so it's a completely different mechanism for this uh, polarized foreground emission. And so the question is then, what happens if you include this in the data? Do you still get a positive measurement or not? Because now you can't blame dust EB anymore. Uh, and so far, nobody has found synchrotron EB. It has been found to be uh, consistent with zero so far. We'll see if that uh, is true in the future. But um, yeah, so far, nobody has found that. So we tried to include that in the data. And another thing I did is also asking, if this is a real cosmological signal, what is the origin of it? And you can do that by looking at the frequency dependence. So you can look at, you can uh, model the cosmic fringes angle as being proportional to the frequency, to the power of some n. And then there are many, many different models, uh, physical theories uh, that will give different n's. So for axon-like fields, it will be a frequency independent signal, so n will be zero. If this is Faraday rotation caused by magnetic fields in our galaxy or primordial galactic fields or, or magnetic fields or whatever, you would see one of the frequency squared. And then there are other like crazy theories out there where you would get uh, n equals to one or two for like yeah, quantum gravity theories or Lorentz violating theories. Yeah, so that could yeah, that could give us a hint of what the signal is. And so uh, in the follow-up paper we did that, we added LFI, I got this plot. So the y-axis here is the cosmic biofringence angle, and the x-axis are the frequency channels that we looked at. So yeah, so we did different approaches here. The black dots with error bars are the measurements we get if we measure cosmic biofringence angle individually for each frequency band. And what you immediately see is that there is uh, something in the LFI channels where synchrotron dominates. Yeah, so you can't fully blame dust EB anymore. And if we try the power law equation I showed in the previous slide, we get the gray sigma band. And the n that you, that you get, on the, that's shown on the right here, is perfectly consistent with zero, uh, which is good news for accident like fields, and it's uh, bad news for Faraday rotation caused by uh, magnetic fields. And also, the green line that you see here is if you assume frequency independence. And so by adding these synchrotron dominated maps, you, uh, the statistical significance increases, which is not what you would expect if we were just measuring dust EB. Yeah, so adding the LFI increased the signif significance, even though it contains synchrotron EB and little to no dust EB. And so we ask ourselves also what happens if you add WMAP data. WMAP has a lot of noise, and uh, but it was still able to slightly decrease the error bars. And WMAP also has a lot of synchrotron channels, so you get more synchrotron maps into your into your analysis. And what would the previous plot have looked like if you varied the sky fraction? Does it look more or less the same as you drop below 0.95 down to say 0.7? Or so by adding LFI, it increased the measurement of beta for all sky fractions, and so. For all sky fractions, the positive beta is uh, yeah more than one sigma wave for all for all sky fractions. Okay, even at the thirty, forty, four, seventy um, gigahertz on its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this one here is for like 0.95 sky fraction. This is the largest sky fraction. Yeah, yeah. So we added a WMAP, and that gave us even higher statistical significance. And for the largest sky fraction, we got three point six sigma, and so once again the significance increased and just to show a bit more how this actually looks like in the plot here you can see 
an averaged EB power spectrum, observed EB power spectrum of all the maps in the analysis. This is the in inverse variance weighted average of all the EB power spectrums. And you obviously see something here. You clearly see the E, e acoustic peaks in this EB power spectrum. And that in itself is like a 10 sigma detection of something. But the question is, are you seeing uh, miscalibration angles or are you seeing cosmic biofringence? But you are seeing something for sure. And you're, seeing, you're not just seeing dust here. Right, because dust, dust would not have acoustic peaks at the same place. It, 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 it would not. Can I, can I ask like what feels like just a ridiculously naive, stupid question here? But how, WMAP and Planck have measured the same cosmic microwave background on the same angular scale. Like WMAP is, is just Planck, but with less resolution. How, how does adding WMAP add anything? It's measured the same foregrounds, the same backgrounds, the same signal. It does, but you get a lot of, or you get some data out of the cross correlations between WMAP and HFI. And that makes the error bar slightly smaller. I see, because of the, it reduces some, some kind of just intrinsic noise signal. Yeah, ex exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's the increase in statistics. If you add one or two, three extra maps, since you are cross correlating all of them, the number of available sources of information multiplies pretty quickly. Okay, so instrumental noise is actually a meaningful uncertainty for this measurement. Yeah, it's all about noise. It's all about noise, I would say. If, uh, if Planck had had much lower noise, we could have measured this so quickly. Yes, and then we did the fitting. We found the uh, cosmic biofringent angle and all the miscalibration angles. And uh, this is how it looks like, how it fits the model. And so you can see that the cosmic biofringent angle can perfectly explain the observed EB power spectrum that you can see in the plot here. And that fits very well with the model. The chi-squared is very, very good. And then we also did the consistency check because as Patricia showed, for larger masks, if you don't take dust EB into account, you certainly get a negative beta when you only look at HFI. But when we did this with uh, double map, double map and Planck, uh, and we added the dust EB model for dust dominated maps, we still get a consistent result, as you can see here, with larger error bars. And so that's very promising. So we go from minus uh, 0 0.2 degrees to almost 0 0.4 degrees. Dust EB matters a lot, and when we take that into account, it increases beta. And also there's a lot of synchrotron-dominated synchrotron maps here that also increases the measurement. Yes, and then we also had a plot just to show you how the miscalibration angles look, because we have, when you when we analyzed Planck plus WMAP together, we have 22 miscalibration angles in total. And the beauty of this is that we're adding independent data sets together, and so you would expect, expect systematics to kind of cancel out. And so even if... Uh, one of the experiments has uh, positive bias miscalibration angles, then you would expect them to cancel each other. Yeah, And as you can see in this plot, the miscalibration angles do seem to center around zero. And you, yeah, you get this positive beta here. If you don't have a positive beta here, you still need something to explain the acoustic peaks that you see in the EB power spectrum. And so that means you have to push all these miscalibration angles 0 0.34 degrees to the right. And so that means certainly you have positive miscalibration angle in HFI and LFI, uh, even though they were created by independent teams. Yeah, because something has to explain the, the acoustic peaks that you see in the EB power spectrum that I showed. Now, this is, this is really interesting that, um, yeah, the different miscalibration angles is, um, it's kind of crucial here that it's, it's not just one, one degeneracy you've got, as you said, 22. Yeah, there's one for each like frequency band or uh, detectors, I can say. So the summary of this Planck plus WMAP analysis is that it gave us 3.6 sigma mesh, and we get consistent results for large and smaller masks. And we know that dust EB has to take in, yeah, be taken into account. And so it's, uh, it's, it's good to see that we get consistent results when dust EB matters a lot and when dust EB matters less. Okay, so we started by talking about the importance of knowing your systematics. So we cannot end without uh, showing you how robust this methodology can be against them. And to do so, we perform a very detailed study of the official M pipe simulations, which are a high fidelity set of simulations that contain all of the known systematics present in plant data. And these results I will be showing you are part of a new paper that I am leading that will hopefully be out by early October this year. So, so stay tuned for that. And just to, to be brief, since we already understood the role that Dust TV plays in the analysis, let me just show you the results that we get when we analyze simulations that contain only CMB noise and systematics to kind of 
isolate the effect of systematics. And this graph right here is showing you the mean angles that we find when we apply the methodology to a hundred of these high fidelity simulations. So the data points are the average angles and the error bar is the simulation dispersion over the square root of n, so it's the error of the mean. And first thing I want to point out is that the angles don't really change from one mask to the other, meaning that none of the known systematics could have produced the decline on beta that we saw as we enlarged the galactic mask, and that confirms our interpretation that it is produced by DustTV. And the second thing, although I'm sure it's the first one that you notice, is that we are finding some very clear systematic angles here. And before raising all of the alarms, let me just say that although with the simulations we can determine the value of these angles very precisely, if we were to go and try to find them in the data, we will only be able to detect them at a two point something sigma significance. So even though it's important to understand what produces them, they are only moderately worrisome. Okay, only moderately worrisome. <laughs> yeah. Without going into, into much detail, we took a closer look at the uh, power spectra of the simulations to try and find out what underlying systematic effect was producing them. And we found out that the most likely explanation is a cross polarization effect, which is kind of the worst news that we could have for this analysis because it introduces something that looks like EE in the observed BB. So this is the worst case scenario for us. And the other message I wanted to stress here is that even though finding these uh, systematic angles and understanding what effect is producing them is very important to understand all of the effects at play both in the simulations and presumably in the data, these specific values that we find here for the angles do not need to agree with the ones that we find in the fit to the data because the simulations do not include and in fact cannot include the actual miscalibration present in the data because that is something unknown. And instead, the main takeaway message is that even in the presence of these types of systematics, this cross-polarization effect, that is the worst kind of systematic we could have, even in that case, the methodology is still capable of capturing their effect into the alpha miscalibration angles and leaving our estimate of birefringence not significantly affected by any of them. You see that here we are finding a mean uh, systematic uh, birefringence angle of 0 0.009 degrees, which is completely negligible when you compare it with the statistical uncertainty of 0.11 degrees that we have in the feed to the data. So this measurement of birefringence is virtually systematic free. We are not significantly affected by, by any of the known systematics. Can, can I just make sure I understand that? So, so you've got like 100A, 100B. Are, are these like two different like 100 gigahertz maps that are then generated and analyzed? Yeah, they are called detector splits, and to produce them, they have taken all of the antennas that they have observing at 100 gigahertz and divided them into two independent subsets. So if one antenna is in A, it's not present in B. And with that, you make sure that your measurements are completely independent so that when you cross-correlate them, you can reduce noise and systematics because they cancel out. Okay, and so then the fact that 100A is very high and 100B is very low, then are like a a combined all 100 gigahertz one is, is giving you the the closer to zero value. Is that is that kind of what I should be understanding here? If you were to just, uh, well, let me think about that, because there is some part of the aim pipe processing pipeline that at some point kind of tries to uh, maximize exactly what you just said. It tries to divide the things so that you have kind of complementary angles in both the splits, so the sum kind of cancels out. But in general, it just might be pointing at the fact that since the subsets of antennas used to be each split are independent, then they can technically have different miscalibrations because they can be in one end of the telescope and in the other and be affected by different things. Okay. And, and can one do such an analysis with the actual Planck data or does the data not exist that it's been split into a, a 100A and 100B in any way? Yes, yes, yes. All, all the results we have shown before are also using these uh, 100A, 100B, etc. splits. Ah, okay. I just, I always only saw like a one data point per frequency, never never an A and a B before. We were showing either by refringence or just using the average of both for the plot that Johannes showed on the frequency. Yeah, for mine, I just uh, uh, assumed the same angle for 100A and 100B. Okay. And would it, what, would, what would the plot look like if you didn't? Like, would you get this drastically different a thing or would it be... I hope not. I haven't tested it, to be honest. But uh, um, we did get the same same angles for 100, 143, and 217, like very consistent results. Yes. So before the conclusion slide, uh, I made a very short FAQ here because these are questions I've been asked uh, a lot during talks. And people wonder, like, when can we say for sure whether this signal is real or not? 
And I hope that ground-based telescopes will start searching for this because I think we need independent measurements, independent people to also start looking for this. Uh, and so, yeah. And I, I think ground-based telescopes are taking this seriously and will start looking for this uh, themselves. You should just say isotropic EB or, or otherwise what is C? Oh, yeah, cosmic biorefringents. Ah, uh, cosmic biorefringents. I see, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we hope uh, ground-based telescopes will look for cosmic biorefringents as well. Uh, by calibrating the instruments as well and not use the foreground to calibrate the instruments. A different question is uh, that people ask me is, are ultralight axes the best explanation? Because that's something we often talk about, these axioms. What, I, what, we, what we can say is that the signal seems to be very frequency independent. And, so, and as far as I know, axioms are the only theory that predicts a frequency independent signal. So a primordial correlation would not be frequency independent? Um, it would, but it wouldn't look like the plot that I showed you, the EB plot. You wouldn't see the acoustic peaks. Why, why not? Um, it depends on your gravitational model, but what we're seeing is exactly identical to the EE power spectrum. And I don't think any primordial, primordial EB correlations would cause something that looks exactly like the EE power spectrum. Okay, okay. Right, right. Whereas an EE that's just been rotated would look exactly like EE. I see. Okay. There's a recent work by Yuto Minami and, and other people, which they try to kind of justify the rotation we are seeing using chiral gravitational waves. And they saw exactly that, that the shape of the spectrum is widely different and that you have to very fine tune the model to get something like that. So it's kind of disfavored at the moment. I guess I'm participating in motivated reasoning because there is this, also this parity violating signal in the large scale structure and just the rotation of the CMB would then be unrelated, I guess, to the large scale structure. Whereas something primordial that then infected both the CMB and the large scale structure would be uh, able to explain both. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that as well. How do you like unify the two? And I think they are. It's not simple because it's uh, to create parity violation in galaxy distributions. You need something to happen during inflation. But what we are seeing is a subtle effect that happens after the CMB was created, and so. I'm not sure how you would, you would unify the two. There's been like a paper that came out today that links biorefringents with early dark energy. So I don't know if that solves exactly the problem we're talking about, but maybe a way to, to try and do it. Literally today. Wow. Okay. That's a <laughs> cutting edge uh, conversations and cosmology talks. Yes. So uh, the conclusion is that we have been working on this for two years, Patricia and I. And as we add more data, we still find the same signal. We have taken the EB of dust seriously, and we have tried to implement it in two independent, completely different ways, and we still get a positive measurement. It's still there. Uh, Patricia has done a lot of work on understanding instrumental systematics, and we haven't found anything that would bias the measurement of beta. And we have also found that the signal is consistent with being frequency independent, which is good news for axion or ultralight axon-like fields. And the next step is that, yeah, we hope that ground-based telescopes will start looking for this effect themselves by calibrating their instruments very well, not using the foreground. Um, so, so any future space-based mission, would it be able to also better calibrate the, the angle if they just did it before they put it in space? Do you need to do ground-based calibration to kind of understand the, the optics of your instrument? But you essentially need to repeat everything again when you are in space. So that gives you like a first idea of how your instrument works. And then you need to find a calibration source in space. It has been done previously using astrophysical sources like the Crab Nebula. But you depend on previous knowledge of the emission of the source. And that's uh, one of the limiting, uh, limiting uh, reasons that have prevented the detection of biorefringents in the past. Because right now you only know of the polarization of the Crab Nebula, for example, with a precision of 0.5 degrees or something close to that. So we're trying to measure something finer than that. Like put, putting, my, putting my kind of crazy hat on, could, could you put something in space next to Lightbird and, and know where you put it and then measure the miscalibration angle like that? That's a proposal we had at the Institute of Physics of Cantabria to put a <laughs> yeah. to put a calibration satellite. Just just it goes there with the satellite. Then when you want to calibrate, it moves in front and then it goes on the back. But for budget reasons, it was rejected for now. I, I mean, yeah. Well, I, I guess it depends on what the state of these biorefringent things are when it comes time to launch, because it might be 
one of the most interesting things that they'd be potentially measuring, I guess. So, but in the meantime, yeah, the ground, I, the, the one thing with the ground based ones, I guess, is that they're never going to get this kind of like F sky of 0.9, 0.95 kind of uh, thing. So even though they might be able to measure their miscalibration angle, they're, they're still going to have a smaller sky fraction, which, um, yeah, but that shouldn't uh, be a problem at all because they can still measure the EE power spectrum of the CMB. And if you can do that, you can also measure the EB power spectrum of the CMB. Sure. I, I guess I'm still just a little worried by this, this sudden phase transition from a flat line to increasing in it being explained by EB foregrounds. Um, but if they calibrate their instruments very well and make the miscalibration angles negligible to the signal we're measuring, then you don't have to worry about the dust EB at all. And I saw that BICEP3 had a very interesting paper out a couple of weeks, months ago, where they said that they are able to calibrate their miscalibration angles very well. And they can guarantee that they are negligible to the 0.3 degrees uh, signal that we are finding. And so we are very eager to see a results paper coming out in not too far future, and hopefully they'll find something. And, and what, why, it seems like it's, a, it's an analysis that then would be trivial to, to do with code that they've already used, but, but maybe, maybe that means that they have got a signal and they're just like, you, you, you know, with the history of BICEP, you would, you would expect that maybe this time they're going to dot every I and cross every T as like meticulously as possible if they're, if they're seeing something new because um, they don't want to, you know, make the same mistake twice. <laughs> Brian Keating also works in measuring EV to, to calibrate angles, so he will already know a lot of the work that has to be done. Ah, so do you say that, that you anticipate they might have a result soon then? They say in their paper, in the conclusions, that our, I think they say our immediate next step is to apply this to real data. And so I'm just sitting, updating or updating archive every day. So we'll see. But I think if, if they do find a very weak hint of a positive beta, like two sigma beta, and they calibrate it by not using the foreground, then that would be very, 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 very cool. It's the confirmation we need for someone else to see the same thing that we're finding. I guess one question I would have is if if you had to gamble on this not being new physics and there was some effect that just hasn't yet been factored in, what, what would you pick as the most likely thing that needs to be accounted for? I mean, this is always an unfair question to ask the people who've done the analysis because if you thought there was something plausible, you'd have you'd have checked. And and so, like, to me, it seems like the foreground EB is still the the one thing that could ruin this. But I also feel like we understand it much better now than we did two years ago. And as I mentioned, adding synchrotron increased the signal. Uh, but you you never know what's the EB of synchrotron. Maybe that bias it too. But then it needs to bias it same amount as EB of dust would bias it. So it's like weird coincidence. Yeah, and it also doesn't happen to be any systematic that we know of. And I only mentioned cross polarization, which has similar spectral shape that we're looking for. But when you try other systematics with different spectral dependencies, for example, beam leakage, we are also robust against that. So I guess that most of the known systematics that are out there, we are not affected by any of them. So it would have to be something very strange that also have to affect at the same time Planck and map data. So Except for new physics right now, I don't know what could be. I should also add to your question, Sean, because you asked what the next step is. Uh, and Patricia and I are still working on uh, squeezing out more data out of the Planck maps. And uh, we have some more tricks up our sleeves. Um, yeah, so there will, be more, there will be more stuff out. But personally, I, I, will, I would love to see this, the same measurement in a different, uh, different data set, a different experiment. What, what work being done in cosmology at the moment do you feel is particularly interesting or underappreciated by the rest of the community? I think, or I don't have a good answer to this, but one thing that has caught my eyes are your previous guests' research, Sean. As you mentioned earlier, the parity violating measurements of uh, galaxy distribution, um, which is what, like seven sigma now or something. And um, it would be very, very cool if you could find parity violating physics on cosmological scales. That would be very cool. And I, that's, and I always try to think of ways to relate that to what we're doing, and maybe there is a connection there. I got very excited during that interview because I thought that it was easily related to what you're doing. But um, I guess the, the, the few weeks since recording that and today, I've realized it's, it's not so easy. It's cosmology parity violation, but not that just because it's the same words doesn't mean it's the same physics, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. I can't really see an obvious way to unify the two. 
I guess I would have liked the cool synergies between galactic science and CMB analysis that we have seen in this work. For example, the work that Susan Clark and collaborators are doing to better understand the interstellar medium has been key to develop the foreground models that we use. And, and in exchange, CMB experiments can give them a lot of very available data to build their models. So that's something that we should continue to, to pursue in the community. All right. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, do subscribe and click the bell if you want to be notified of new videos and click like to help with YouTube algorithms. You'll help me and you'll help yourself because YouTube will know what to recommend to you and share the channel with colleagues. If you have questions or suggestions, leave a comment. Yeah, maybe check out the video we've just been talking about, uh, about parity violation in the large scale structure, which should be appearing on the screen somewhere at the moment. And thanks, uh, Johannes and Patricia for the great talk. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you.